Um, so this, this is going to be a strangely paced lecture. So if you have questions, ask. This is really, this is real bioinformatics. This is not textbook in any way, shape or form. So if you see errors, also speak up, please. There may be some of them in this presentation. All right, so originally, the name of this talk for all the major conferences was Functional Basis of Microorganism Classification. But um, for people who actually try to follow it, it's, it's that. Tell me who, what you do and I'll tell you who you are. And um, I'm told that you guys are more computationally inclined than biologically inclined, is that correct? So I'm going to give you a lot of background, okay? So this guy you probably heard of, his name is Charles Darwin, and um, he says in 1859, I was much struck by how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. So he goes traveling, he goes to get to Galapagos, sees these guys, these birds, and for some reason they are differentiated. This one is, um, well, right now, Geospita magnirostris, I can't even pronounce this, Geospita fortis, Certhiria olivacea, and Geospita parvola, which actually had migrated a genus and a species, right? So these are Latin names for these birds. Now, Darwin knows them as large ground finch, medium ground finch, green warbler finch, and small tree finch. Now, I'm sure if I had color, this guy would be green somehow, but I have no idea how to tell large from medium from small and whether it lives in a tree or not, right? But apparently they had some classifications on the basis they could, of which they could actually name them. Right? So this was okay for these birds, it was okay in 1859, it was okay for an observationalist. Uh, and now you get this, right? So these are bacteria, try to classify those. Is that the large bacteria? Or is that the green one? I mean, this, this gets a little more difficult than, than that classification. So. Why do we classify things to begin with? Any ideas? Why do we care about classification? Yeah, go ahead. Right, so like what she's saying is it's much easier for us to know what to expect from this or that object. Okay, wonderful. So you're the first person to actually answer that question in a way that I expect people to answer that question. Um, the first thing, uh, which you didn't name, but uh, it's really somewhat coincidental to what you are saying. So we like to name things, right? So this, in my definition, and I hope in everybody else's, is a car, okay? Or the car, as I would like to name it. Um, okay, so that's a car. Uh, classifying thing teaches us about history, I'll tell you how. Steam engine, gasoline engine, diesel engine, hybrid car, and hopefully we get... Ooh hydrogen car at some point, right? So that tells us where we are progressing and how we are progressing. But I need to classify these cars individually first. And then finally, the most important aspect is that they, we know how to react to them in the future. And this is what you were referring to. So in this particular case, how do we treat these cars? Uh, how do we use these cars? And how do we avoid getting hit by these cars, okay? So this is, uh, this is really the things that we want to look at. Um, am I running around too much? <laughs> no, it's fine. It's all good. Thank you. Um, so that we know how to react to them in the future. And, uh, you know, as, as important that is for cars, it's actually a little more important for microorganisms because they kind of run this world. There is a lot of them. All right. So in order to classify them, we need to figure out what is the basic unit of classification. And for now, for now, in this world, we believe it's a species, right? So in biology, a species is defined by two things. It's one of the basic units of biological classification and the taxonomic rank. Now we need to define what is biological classification, and that is a method used to group and categorize organisms into groups known as taxa. Right? So basically, back to our car story, if these were the species that I had, of cars and I had come up with that thing, where would I group it according to my classification? Well, I could either group it into the cars because of the engine that it could potentially have, or I can group it into the bikes because it kind of looks more like a bike than a car, okay? 
So depending on what I use for classification, I can group this, or this organism into a new group, into an existing group. Is that clear so far? Should be very basic, okay. So then we get to the taxonomic rank. The taxonomic rank is a little more complicated, but really still very basic. It's the level of the relative position in a taxonomic hierarchy, subsuming under it a number of less general hierarchies, right? So the idea is we start with all of life, then we have domains, kingdoms, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and genus species is what you are getting as the name of the organisms in the end, right? So every two organisms that are in the same genus are also in the same family. Is that clear? Can you repeat this last one? So every two organisms that are in the same genus are also in the same family. Okay, so that basically means if you're back to cars, you might get the theme here at some point. Uh, then this is all of transport that we have, and this is land transport, so I removed airplanes and, and boats. And then we have large capacity transport, um, transporting people, and transporting adults, right? So we can go this way. So usually it's transporting adults. Sometimes the kids get to ride in a fire truck, okay? All right, so this is how this works. So very simple, very basic, should work perfectly. What's the problem, okay? It's always very complicated when it comes to biologists. They don't do this computational stuff. They don't get the whole idea of bins and classes and this is how it's supposed to be, right? So they designed this new word which is somehow related to the word species and speciation, right, which is the formation of species, is the evolutionary process by which new biological species arise. So now this gets really complicated, right? So we had our really good binning for on whatever basis we had initially and now you have the speciation process, so this is, let's say, a species that we've got, and all of a sudden its environment changes, right? So it's no longer living in salt water, it migrates to fresh water or the other way around, for instance, right? And when does this happen? I don't know, you have a volcano eruption or a tide or whatever, right? So this group of organisms, and there's a couple of them that, that are all of the same species, right? Some of them are exposed to this new environmental stress and some of them are not. And so what happens? you get a different group, right? So this is what happens with speciation. You get a different group. Now here's the kicker. If that group looks like somebody else, right? According to us, we should have classified these two into a single species. But according to speciation, formation of species is an evolutionary process. So it's always going to be here. Does that make sense, right? So in the end, we start here, we get there, this looks like that, but we don't regroup it. Does that make sense? No, it does not make sense. Okay, so again, species, we define. This is basically a bunch of bins, right, for placing organisms on the basis of their similarities. Is that correct? Everyone gets that? Now, speciation, which is the formation, this is biology now, this is life, not computer science. Okay, um, but uh, the, the idea is that um, in biology, speciation is an evolutionary process, right? So evolution is, you guys know what evolution is, right? <laughs> so what is evolution? Someone speak up. What's evolution? <laughs> uh, due to changes in the environment uh, and a combination of random mutations over generations, you see uh, the development of new species over time. Okay, so that's uh, speciation. That's not evolution, but it's speciation. Okay, right, so the speciation is an evolutionary process. So we go from here, you know, this, this species over here, with exposure to novel environments, to a formation of a substrate, first a strain and then eventually a species, which is evolutionarily related to that species, happens to be that both are then in the same genus, right? Because we haven't changed anything in that direction. But this species, because of all the qualities it acquired, functions that it acquired over time, now may potentially look more like that. Remember in the very beginning I showed you a car that looked like a bike? And we made the decision on where to place it, a conscious choice, right? Biology doesn't follow conscious choices. It just does what it needs to do to survive. The organisms do what they need to do to survive. So speciation actually disrupts our definition of species. 
Okay? Is that clear? Yes? No. Okay, why not? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I well, don't, don't get it into the video last sentence. Well, so, do you understand what species is? Yeah, yeah. I what is it? It's, um, how do you say, it's the more specific um, classification in the taxonomy. Okay, and what is speciation? Speciation is the formation of a new species. Using what method? Using mutations. Using evolution, right? So mutation, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, so the formation of new species uses this concept of evolution. Yeah. Now, is evolution constrained by your definition of what the species is? Evolution is not constrained by anything. Evolution is gonna do whatever it needs to do, right? Whatever it does. Okay. Do you understand that, right? So whatever your definition is, Evolution does not relate to that. So the moment you introduce this random variable of evolution, all of your bins go out the window. Does that make sense? You mean evolution in general? Well, yes. In sense. Yes. The pressure to select for the fittest organisms in a particular environment. Yeah, but evolution forms um, causes speciation, right? I'm sorry? In this case, evolution causes speciation. Right, so speciation is basically developing a new bin, yeah. right? Okay. It, but it's not developing a new genus, right? Because it's, it's developing first on a lower level, oh, okay. right? So you could theoretically have two bins that were similar to begin with, right? Yeah. And then you form a third bin from one of these bins, and this third bin looks more like the one it's not related to immediately. Okay. How long did you plan for? If I interrupt you, that will be a solid three minutes now. Uh, how long did I plan? I have 80 slides. Wherever we get to, we get to. <laughs> okay, let me interrupt. Okay. Interruption. It is fine. I, you have significantly more experience in doing this than I do, so <laughs> go ahead. Um, all right, so the, the, the problem, I think, my, my problem is English language, or whatever language, natural language, okay? This speciation and that species are actually related by a root and they are meant to indicate the same um, thing, right? But what we come to think of as the meaning of the word species, which is, you know, that whole story about why do we classify things, right? Is not what is the meaning of the word species, right? So we think we know what species is. We think that we, we can understand that. But in reality, we can't. And the reason is, and I will get to that, um, the precursor, the reason is sex. I will tell you later. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's, let's get here. So... There was this some precursor to all of these things, right? And we can potentially trace the evolutionary route, okay? From here to there to there to there to there to there to there, potentially, okay? But the reality is that we, we can't trace them. We can assume that there was this evolutionary route or that evolutionary route or this evolutionary route. And the reason we can't really decide what they are is because we're not looking at all of these things rather or, or that yeah that one I don't believe at all but um, the, the reason we can do it is because we are only looking at these things right now right we're not looking in history we do not know where speciation has occurred okay we're looking only at the things we know yes a bicycle cannot be we know the history a bicycle cannot what <laughs> no, for these things we know the history Okay, uh, come on, <laughs> bear with me. I want to be Italian for this. I want to go like, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, and, and theoretically, you can group them into species like this, right, on the basis of where the components are, or like this, on the basis of the overall use, okay? And at, even at this point, there are conflicts, right? So you may decide I want to group it this way for one reason, and I may decide I want to group it this way for another reason. So a species problem is really a bunch of really hard questions that arise from the somewhat conflicted definition of the word species and speciation. And this is what we've been talking about for now, okay? And uh, here's why. 
Okay, we're getting to the sex part. So usually when we think about the taxonomy of life of these genus species stories, we think about the tree of life. So the, the assumption for the tree of life is that once two organisms speciate, separate, they do not any longer interact on a genetic level. Right, so you, you probably remember from high school biology that uh, one of the definitions of a species is that two organisms cannot produce a fertile offspring, right? So if you have a mule, Right? That's you know, not a species in itself. We don't even classify that as anything because it's not fertile, it cannot continue. Okay, so in the case of eukaryotes, that means that if you had a fungus and a plant, which are these two things here, right? you would never ever have a fun plant. <laughs> right? That just would not happen because the fungus and the plant do not interact on a genetic level. Unfortunately, in or fortunately in bacteria, uh, bacteria are a lot less, uh, you know, typical. They're like, yeah, we don't care. So we're going to interact on all levels, right? And the idea is that if you have a green, a green filamentous bacteria and the proteobacteria, you can potentially have a green proteobacteria. Okay, and here is where the sex comes in. Eukaryotes reproduce via sex, right? And bacteria are asexual, right? So they divide, and the way that they get their genetic um, stuff, additional stuff, additional genes, is by a whole bunch of ways of horizontal gene transfer, okay? So basically you can have transformation where there is one cell that's releasing DNA that's inserting into another cell. You can have trans transduction via some outside factors and you can have bacterial conjugation which some people think of as sex which is not, okay? All right, so the idea is that bacteria exchange DNA in ways which eukaryotes can't exchange. Okay, so in eukaryotes, you, once you've differentiated, there is no more DNA exchange. In bacteria, there is lots of DNA exchange. And that really confuses the tree of life, and it forms for a bush of life. Okay, so it's no longer tree, it's now this mess. So, we get to the point. Nature doesn't classify organisms. Nature doesn't care which species you belong to. All these kinds of cool organisms doesn't say you should be with this organism or you should be with that organism. Doesn't do that. We do that. We come up with these terms which we believe somehow describe whatever feature of that particular organism we want. And we can do that with tigers and lions and bears, right? But we can't really do that with Streptococcus pneumoniae, right? Or Staphylococcus aureus. You can't do that. The colors here, this is all computational stuff, right? They're not real, they don't. Okay, so what do we do with bacteria? Well, usually to classify things, you need distance matrix, right? And the one thing that we had for a very long time in um, comparing bacteria was DNA-DNA hybridization. So very simply, you take an organism, uh, you take another organism, and you want to ask, do they belong to the same species? Okay? So you take one and you label its genome one way, you take another, you label its genome another way, uh, you denature the genomes, let them recombine, and ask the question of, is there recombination across these genomes, not in the genetic sense recombination, not crossing over, but pairing of different genomes. Do you guys understand what she means when she says label the genome? She puts actually the genome consists of a lot of letters. Sorry. She puts a marker on every single letter. In principle, that's the idea. Uh, one is blue, one is, one is red. And then you see how much red only, how much blue only, how much red blue. The red blue is, so when they come together, because DNA forms double EDCs, so when, when they recombine, then you will see sort of either the mix of color, the same color, and that will tell you the recombination. Thank you. Sorry. Please stop me if, if something is unclear. I, I have a biology background. Some things are second nature, okay? All right. Um, so it used to be that 70% DNA, DNA uh, rehybridization. 
hybridization rate, wow, uh, was the, um, the answer, right? So if you had more than 70% DNA-DNA hybridization rate, that means the two genomes of these two organisms were so similar that you can safely call them the same species, okay? So remember, the, the DNA forms this double helix on the basis of how similar the regions of DNA are, right? So if it couldn't form this double helix, then it would not do it, and therefore it would be different species, but it did. Okay. So, yeah? Uh, when a new species is formed, uh, does this new species uh, fall in the same genus or in different genus? Like, you know, the figure which you showed earlier? Well, it has to fall, fall in the same genus initially, right? So the speciation is a formation of two different... But when you're mapping it to different species of different genus, then does it mean that it matches to the genus of... It looks like. So remember, the bacteria, they do asexual reproduction and they get genes from other bacteria. So let's say you have two organisms living in the same environment, right? Let's say in salt water. They're living next to each other in this drop of salt water. Right? One happens to be from one species and the other one happens to be from another species, but they decide they want to exchange DNA for whatever changes in environment that they experience. So now, even though they're from different species, they look the same because they've exchanged some part of their DNA. Does that make sense? Yes? So we still have the same definition for speciation and species in eukaryotes and bacteria? Yeah, we still do, and this is what I'm trying to change. <laughs> so Wait, here's another point that I'd like to add to the 70%. Yeah. So this speci the speciation event would of course call them the same. Remember, right? So this this test here is done. In principle is done for things that are more different than at the speciation event. Speciation event. I don't know what the. What the Speciation event is not a discrete point in time. Yeah. That's the issue, right? So it's not like here you're the same species and here you're a different species. And so that's, that's always very difficult with continuous variables, right? So you, you can decide the, the VDH rate. So this was a, a cutoff, right? So where do you decide that something is a car and not a bike? What is your cutoff? But again, let me repeat. So <laughs> if we had to two offsprings from the same genus, and they would be considered a speciation event, most likely they would be classified by the DH as the same species. On that cause graininess, that's what I mean. This measure is more meant for things that are more different. So we have, and that I do not talk about, uh, for every species also strains, right? So every species has unofficial subsets, right? And these strains are the ones that if continue in divergence could potentially form more species. The problem is that biology is very, the, this kind of biology is very young and we still don't have a very good grasp of what's going on. By the way, just as a coincidental, there are at least two strains of E. coli for which this is not the case. Yeah, one of them is lab derived and it has lost 40% of its genome as unnecessary. Right? So then it wouldn't do that, it couldn't do that. <laughs> Make sense? Okay. This part is still called E. coli. So. But it's E. coli because that's where it came from. It was E. coli. We took out some of its genome. It's still E. coli. Okay? All right. I'm just uh, hoping that I'm not completely disappointing people <laughs> with this biology thing. <laughs> no hope. All right. Um, DNA DNA hybridization is extremely expensive. And Almost everything you do in biology is going to be time-consuming and expensive, okay? DNA-DNA hybridization is both. So we didn't want to do that. We wanted to do something that would be cheaper and faster and easier to do. In the 70s, this guy named Carl Wersey came up with the idea that you can use markers of the genome, particular genes of the genome, in order to identify the same species or different species. Because again, speciation is an evolutionary process, so therefore all the forces that apply to the entire genome should apply to individual genes, particularly essential genes that you cannot lose. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, essential genes. What do we do? What does every cell do? Every cell does translation. Right, so it takes DNA to RNA, right, and then RNA is translated into proteins. 
Okay, so the translation is accomplished by these guys, the assembled ribosomes. Ribosomes have a large subunit and a small subunit. In bacteria, the small subunit contains 21 proteins and one 16S rRNA, right? It's called, it's an rRNA. It's called 16S RNA. The interesting part about 16S RNA, all, all bacteria have 16S RNA. We uh, eukaryotes have 18S RNA, a bigger version of that, okay? So the cool part about 16S RNA and the reason why Carl Verzi had suggested it is because it could be used as a molecular clock. So what does that mean? 16S RNA has regions that are conserved. This green stuff over here, it's a 1500 base pair sequence, and these green things are the conserved regions. So in order to function in its function, in translation, right, in being part of a ribosome, it needs to actually have these regions of 16S RNA conserved. They're structurally a very particular form, okay? And then there are regions which are not conserved, okay? And what does that mean? That means if you assume a constant evolutionary rate, then these regions that are not conserved are all going to mutate ab at about the same rate. So the further you are in those regions, right, the more mutations you've accumulated, the longer it has been since you were the same species. Is that clear? Yeah, so there are conserved regions, things that don't change. And then there are variable regions. And if you make the assumption that the variable regions are not constrained by functionality of 16S RNA, therefore they are subject to the neutral drift, to mutation at neutral uh, speeds, I guess, right, at whatever the speed is. And then the more of these mutations you accumulate, the further away you guys are in evolutionary time. Right? So, of course, there is an issue of you know, environmental stress. So, if you expose a cell to a lot of radiation, it's going to mutate faster. Right? Or not cell, if you expose a population of cells, it's going to mutate faster. Uh, but the idea is that the, because every organism has this 16S RNA, and you can make certain assumptions about global uh, evolutionary relatedness of organisms, you can somehow estimate that further distance is actually indicative of a deeper branching, right? So when they split from the original species. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Uh, is it really a safe assumption that all of the variable regions would mutate at about the same rate? No, it's not. And this is what I'm saying, right? So the, they would probably not. Uh, well, no. So all the variable regions in one 16S RNA are basically going to mutate at about the same rate, right? The, they're not very far in the genome to, to have a problem with genome architecture, if that's what you're suggesting. Uh, but uh, the different organisms are going to mutate at different rates. Right? So someone that lives in a desert, for instance, is going to mutate differently from someone that lives in a tide pool. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Right. Okay, so, but, but the idea is, in the end, that this is, this is an approximation. This is not you know, the end all and be all. Yes? This is a sequence of bases, right? Yes, nucleotides, right. Okay, so what do we do as good computer scientists <laughs> to, to figure out whether this is meaningful or not? We map DNA-DNA hybridization rate, which is our gold standard, versus 16 sRNA sequence identity, okay? To try to figure out whether our 16 sRNA is a good marker for similar, uh, species similarity. Does that make sense? So you take two organisms, you do the experimental stuff, and then you compare, compare it to the 16S RNA identity. And this is 2001, okay? This is not very long time ago. Okay, so we took 350 organism pairs. And we asked, here's our species common boundary. Remember, this is the 70% DNA-DNA hybridization rate. And this is our 16S RNA sequence identity over these variable regions, right? So not over the conserved regions, those are conserved, okay? So what do we see? Well, very clearly, very clearly, <laughs> um, anything that's under 
96, 97% sequence identity is actually to the left of the species common boundary. Right? So all the dots over here are of different species. So we can use this metric, this 97%, to say that anything below 97% sequence similarity is a different species. Okay? And then the other problem is, that, I mean, the problem is that when you look at above 97%, what you see is the same species as well as different species. So what that means is that you can use this 97% as a difference, a lower bound, right? But not as a higher bound of estimating diversity. Okay, so there could be a lot more species in whatever you're looking at than what you're estimating. Is that clear? Uh, how do we, how do we reach at a 97% now? I, I, we just plotted the, the dots. Because the dots are equally, I think, above that 97% I'm sorry, I don't understand. So the you can see a big cluster of uh, dots above 97 percent. So in the, in the same region, I mean. Yeah, but the this side is all empty. So you need to be empty over here. So this is why we're not taking these guys, right? So in order to be a different species, you have to be to the right. Let me go a few steps back. So now in Yana, so first Yana attacks the idea of 70% and all of these things. Now for this slide, let's just assume that 70% were a good cutoff, or that we had a cutoff between 50 and 70, okay? This is green. So everything to the right of this bar that is greenish is assumed to be a different species, okay? Now, what you also observe, if you now would not have the x-axis, the DDH axis, and all you had is sequence comparison, because that's much cheaper, can we then find the line can we say things that are entirely identical, very, very similar, they fall on the right side, and things that are very dissimilar fall on the left side? So she says, okay, what we can do is we can say below 96, or wherever you put the mark, I'm safe. Everything below some mark that is this sort of uh, yellowish kind of color, uh, tan kind of color, below that, you're fine because you're also left of the green. But the problem is, above that tan color, you cannot make the opposite statement. So it is not true that above any line that you draw, everything is on the right side. That's so far, I'm not sure where the next table is, but that's what she said so far. So if we make the assumption that 70% DNA-DNA hybridization rate is the definition of the same species, can we find a cheaper way of finding that same species? Right? And this is our cheaper way. And how does the cheaper way correlate to our gold standard? Well, this is how. Okay? All right. So this apparently was good enough for about 10 years. And everybody went to town because it's fairly easy to get this 16S RNA. You can design primers, DNA primers, to fish them out of uh, the pool of organisms. Right? Is everyone okay with that? Absolutely. Maybe I misunderstood. I thought you said uh, only bacteria have 16 SLA. Yes. So we are only talking about finding, uh, determining different species among the bacteria. Right, we are focused on bacteria. So eukaryotes, I'm going to assume we have a, a handle on because they kind of do what they do with the sexual reproduction. Okay? Uh, the bacteria are the ones that we are most interested in this case. It's also archaea, but for now let's focus on bacteria. Okay? So the idea is that um, because we had this new technique, this ability to fish, uh, to differentiate same species, different species on the basis of 16S RNA, and 16S RNA was fairly simple to identify. It's not a very long gene. It has conserved regions to which you can design genetic primers so you can pull them out, right, of the, the mix of, of bacteria or of cells. Or, and the idea was that you can say that for every species there is a 16S RNA marker. So you can create a database of sequences, right, that represent a 16S RNA of a particular bacterium. Could you give us, you said a lot, or you, you used all kinds of numbers, but could you tell us all of these dots 
to get the y-axis, how much would that cost, or how much time would that be, and how much would it cost to get the x-axis? That's a very good question. Um, so this is we're doing this over ten years. Okay, so this is where we're going through immense development in terms of sequencing, right? So DNA, DNA hybridization, standard experimental techniques, I can't even begin to approximate, but I'm guessing it's upwards of $100 to do per, per, per yeah, per, per pair. And that's not counting the postdoc that banks his head against the wall while he's trying to grow these organisms, okay? Um, but uh, the, the idea is that uh, Sequencing 16s RNA right now is what a dollar, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the idea, right? But then, of course, you know we we went from 2001 to today, and the drop is tenfold, so hundredfold. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So what we did, what people do when, when something goes on sale is they do a lot of it, right? They buy a lot of it. So, so even if they don't need it. So everybody goes out and starts sequencing things, right? Uh, 16 sRNAs. And we get databases. And there are three really big databases. One is called Green Genes. One is called Silva. There is also a third one called RDP. And this is what happens when you let people just sequence, okay? At random. So you t we took one sample of mixed bugs, of a lot of mixed bugs, right? So basically, we took a bunch of soil and there is a whole bunch of, yeah? Bugs are typically eukaryotes. <sighs> Microbes. <laughs> Sorry, English, right? Um, not my first language. No, the, the things creeping in your head that you don't want. Yes, the things creeping in my head we cannot justify with 16 sRNA. Okay. So the idea is that we took ground, just a bunch of soil samples, and we sequenced the 16 sRNA of every bacterium living in the, 60, in the soil sample, right? So we can do that. And then we asked, can we map to these databases the 16 sRNA sequences that we have and ask what is the content, bacterial content of this soil? Okay? Clear that this is the question. This is the same soil sample. All right. The gray and the black is the differences in the organisms that were assigned to that soil sample by two different databases. Okay? Is that, is that clear? Do you see the problem? Here is another two databases. All right? And then back to those two, the two they all told. There are no databases, no two databases that will give you the same assignment in 16. Yeah? Do these databases have different geographical regions? Mm -hmm. um, so you don't. So you, as an experimentalist, you get your 16 sRNA, and you are forced by many funding agencies to deposit the sequence into a database, one database, right? So in I don't know Asia. You deposit it in one, in the States you deposit it into the other. Potentially, yes, but no one's requiring you to deposit them into a specific one. So, yeah, probably there is a preference. I know Italians tend to stick to one database, you know, Americans tend to stick to another. Um, I don't know what the story in Russia is. So, you know, but the idea is that uh, in the end they're supposed to be equal. So you are supposed to be able to get the same 16 sRNA for the same species, right? No matter where you go. Otherwise, it shouldn't be the same species. But you don't. So the differences are explained by something that's not in the other database. Have you checked that? Or? No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with the, the quantity. This is a very high level, right? So this is not species level. This is a higher level. This is one thing. And the other thing is that... Um, what is the total number? Of, of what, 16 sRNAs? Yeah. That's the percentage We're of We're talking, oh, oh, wait, here? Mm, that's percentage of how many? This is... 100%. Oh, uh, you, you get uh, something like on the order of 100,000. Oh. <laughs> uh, so it's not, it's not a small thing, okay. right? In, in the bacterial, in a soil sample, you'd be surprised how much stuff lives in the soil sample. Um, but the idea is that 
there is there is reasons for this. So clearly, there's geographical preference. There is content of databases. To a certain extent, everything adds up. But then there is also chimeric sequences, right? So basically, people who had uh, submitted things that are not real, right? Because 16S RNA is very similar across organisms, you can potentially have contamination of your sample and assemble 16S RNA differently, right? And you wouldn't even know it because the conserved regions are the same. Uh, you can have sequencing error because at 97% sequence identity, you need you know a couple of residues that are off, and then you are also getting a different sequence. And uh, of course, the, the other thing is that. All of this is voluntary, right? So whoever is submitting stuff is doing it on a voluntary basis, and the people who are um, making the databases that are making the alignments of 16S RNA where you need to know uh, what sequence aligns where, right? They are doing it on the basis of the parameters that they decided were the best, right? So we think this is good, so they think this is good, the different database maintenance personnel thinks that's good, right? So there is always this room for negotiation, and when we're talking about a small amount of difference, small difference, then you have an issue. Does that, is that clear for everybody? Okay. So very interestingly, this was the plot that my student had put together very early on, so forgive the lack of graphics. The idea is that if you took 97% sequence identity, so if you align 16S RNA, of, organisms of 1,100 organisms that we had at that point in the repository of NCBI. And you looked at their sequence identity. And you asked, how often is the species, the same species of this pair predicted accurately? And how many of the same species pairs that it should cover, it does it actually cover? You can draw a plot like this, right? So just focus on one, on the green for now, right? So. This is your 97% sequence identity, and that, at that 97% sequence identity, you're about 50% accurate. You get the same species pair 50% accurate for about 80% of the species pairs, right? So not only do you use 20% of the things you should be getting, but also for every call that you make, you have a 50% chance of being right, okay? This is very poor, just in case you didn't recognize this performance as being poor. Um, the difference between the red and the green is that some organisms happen to have different 16S RNAs. They happen to have not one gene, but multiple genes within the species. Right? So the same species, but has different 16S RNAs. So the difference is taking just any 16S RNA versus the highest. Okay? highest similarity. So maximizing coverage versus maximizing accuracy, but that doesn't even help here. So one may ask, how does uh, NCBI or a particular researcher actually decide what is a species, right? So yeah, we said 16S RNA, uh, sorry, we did 70% DNA DNA hybridization rate, but nobody does that anymore. Right? So they didn't, obviously didn't do that for 11,000 organisms, for 1,100 organisms. So they did something else. And what they did, if you go to the Burgess Manual, which is like the Bible of um, classification, is you use 16S RNA similarity, and then you compare physiology and morphology of the organisms. Who knows what physiology and morphology are? Shape and, and? processes. Yeah, molecular functionality. So basically, a guy who's been doing, oh, usually it's a guy, but sometimes it's a girl that has been doing this for many, many years, decide, looks at these two organisms, at what they know about it, maybe two or three tests, or maybe not even those, maybe just looking at it under the microscope, and decides, yeah, 16S RNA looks good, these guys look similar, these bugs look similar, let's assign them to the same species, all right? Obviously, this is not the way it's done, and I, you know, but, but this is the concept, okay? Is that clear? All right. So it always bothered me. Uh, there are other markers 
So it's not just 16 sRNA, I'm not going to talk about those. But they're not better. They don't do any better than this. Okay, and actually for other markers there is a smaller set of databases out there. So it's if you actually were doing microbiology research right now, you would be using 16 sRNA databases. And at this point, this is three years into my research, in this it drives me insane talking to these people. Where they get answers they do not expect, and then they come to me and say, why not? <laughs> okay, so this is what it looks like to me. We do a lot of experimental stuff. We isolate culture, purify these organisms, right? We do lots and lots of that stuff. Then we, on the basis of that, build complicated treatments, design antibiotics, you know, bioremediation techniques, based on this bacterial similarity, right? And then this part, the computation of bacterial similarity is actually very meaningless, okay? And this is what we want to focus on, on, on what happens when the, the miracle occurs. So I think you guys must have seen this slide at least 25 million times, have you? No? Wow, I'm, I'm so happy when I get to show this slide first. It almost never happens. Um, so this is Moore's Law. Everybody knows what Moore's Law is? No? Wow, this is a computer science audience. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes, but more, 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 that's not Moore's Law. That is Moore's Law. No, no, Moore's changed. Oh. What? Is it really? Yeah. What, what, is your, what is between, 80, what do you do in 18 months double? You put the number of transistors that fit on yeah, the chip, many, yeah? You have a double here? The line is two? You're doubling every 18 months, yeah. And that's over since 90, with, what? 99 or? I actually went in and I got that. No, it's not over since 99. Yes, he, no. He said that. No, in 2005 he said that it was still going. No, but not at the same rate. I, I can produce a plot. <laughs> yes. Well, if we were to produce a plot and look at the frequencies of actual CPUs, we would see that the, the frequencies are basically staying the same since uh, about 2005. Sure, frequencies. Yeah, that that's a, a <laughs> that's a different one. The law is not working anymore. No, the law is working. He said in 1965 that the number of transistors that can be inexpensively placed on a chip doubles approximately every 18 months. The uh, processing power does not grow from these transistors because in order to utilize Sure, but the law is yeah. the law, right? Yeah, it's true. We, we all apply it in a different context. You're right. So actually, in a different talk that I give, I, I show this Moore's Law story and I say it's been given the name. That name has been given to everything that grows exponentially, which is not true. Right, so, uh, but Moore's Law is, is... So I would have to go back I am pretty sure it, it stays... Uh, no, but our point, just let me... Yeah. Our point is the idea, why is the voice law so attractive? Because it describes the speed of processing. Speed. Some, some, or you could put it into memory or into something that sort of reflects the growth of hardware of computation, in general, ability yeah. with hardware. And that somehow broke. And that Fair enough. I take your point. Take your argument. But whatever. There is a, there's, still, there's still a line, maybe it's not that dramatic anymore. There is a, another slide, which I realize that I'm missing here, is where the, the speed of uh, computational decline of, of the cost of computation versus the speed of uh, genome analysis, of genome production, you know, it kind of goes like this in log world, and so then you're at the bottleneck. <laughs> all the is going in the wrong direction, only because you asked her for Moore's Law. That's where the problem started. In principle, she's going to make the difference between these two curves as her main point. And what we say makes the white one go further up. It makes her point stronger. That's fine. Um, actually, there is no, no point other than saying that the cost of sequencing has dropped. Right? And the bottleneck is now informatics, but uh, other than... The technology <laughs> continues to be a big problem that these two things go, uh, grow apart. Well, they, they've already at this point, I think, passed each other, right? So we can, we can argue that we are the bottleneck now. Absolutely. The imp interpretation is the, is the bottleneck. Okay, so the idea is that uh, was the appearance of next generation, of the mainstream next generation sequencing. 
the cost of sequencing has dropped tremendously. So there is no reason why we should be doing just 16S RNA sequencing. We could be doing the sequencing of entire genomes or transcriptomes, okay? All right, and um, the assumption for the rest of this talk uh, is this notion of the genome to proteome to functional. Now there's a lot of caveats here, right? You, just because you encode a particular gene doesn't mean that you actually actively use this gene in your life as a bug, as a bacterium. And um, just because we know what the protein is doesn't mean that we can actually determine its function very well. Okay, but in the end, this is the process that we're going to be focusing on. So let me address that last part uh, just a little bit. If you actually looked at the annotations, at the functional annotations of bacterial proteins, okay, and you ask how many of uh, bacterial proteins were functionally annotated, so we knew what is the function of this particular protein, what you would get is this distribution curve. This is the fraction of the bacterial proteum that is annotated, uh, that is not annotated, I'm sorry, in this case, right? And each line on here, if you saw the lines, would be a bacterium. There is 1172 bacteria in this chart. And what you see is that there are some bacteria, you can take a wild guess about which one that is, are completely annotated, so they are or almost completely annotated, right? And some bacteria are almost completely unannotated, okay? So there is a, a huge span over here, and the average number, the average amount of the unannotated proteins in the, in the genome, uh, in the proteome, is 35%, right? More or less. So about a third of the bacterial proteome is usually not annotated with a function. And this is important because if we're going to use function in order to describe similarity of bacteria, we need to know what these functions are. Okay? And so a very interesting finding, which I think doesn't surprise anybody, but I, th I don't believe anyone has ever quantified it, is that we, if we looked at bacteria that uh, were annotated as living with a human host, with fresh water, in the freshwater environment, in marine environment, or soil environment, we see that functions are most annotated, and this is statistically significant, for the bacteria that live in the human host. So surprise, surprise, we like ourselves, we don't care about the environment, okay? That's the idea. So, is that, is that a clear slide? It's not, okay. So now, I'm afraid to show my next slide. Does this look familiar, Burkhardt? <laughs> Um, you guys have seen this before, I'm assuming. Okay, then I'm just going to skip it. So, since we don't have any annotations, it's nicer to use uh, the story of HSSP in order to design similarity of proteins, okay? Uh, obviously, HSSP is a measure of protein function similarity, so if it's a high score, then they're similar. Then it's the same function, and it's a low score, it's a different function, right? So very important for the next step here, for this step here, is the notion uh, that a higher HSSP score does not indicate that the larger fraction of the function of the protein is shared, right? So if you imagine that the function of the protein is 100% in some world, it doesn't mean that if you have a higher HSSP score between two proteins, that, that more of that 100% is shared. It's more of a binary value. It's either shared function or not shared function. Is that understandable? Am I making a wrong statement or? <laughs> I am full, okay, fine. Everyone gets that, right? So if... The issue is that uh, we have to go from percentage to something that is yes or no, right? Yes. Well, but it's not an issue, right? So your, your value, your HSSP score, indicates how likely you are that this is a correct functional assignment. But it doesn't necessarily, or it doesn't directly mean that you share a certain fraction of the molecular function. That's a postulate. Huh? That's a postulate. So I, I think about the curves in EC world and I 
kind of feel that this is a, a correct statement. But let, let's, let's make an assumption. Let's make it an axiom for now <laughs> that this is the case. And then we can discuss. So the idea, the reason why this is important is because the network of the proteins, and this is 4.2 million proteins in an all-to-all -all alignment that we make, okay, is going to be a yes or no network. So two proteins either share function or do not share function. Okay? So what we did in order to cluster that space, in order to determine the functions of these proteins, can I just skip all the computational stuff? Does everybody know? <laughs> um, Is that the Russian spelling of Martin? Did I make a mistake? Would you reckon with a C in Russia? In Russian? There is no C and K in, in, in Russian, it's just K. Okay. So, why? It is, is it with a K? We give it as a copy with a K, yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay, so everybody knows the Markov clustering algorithm then? No? Oh. Sorry? It's the S, I forgot. What is the S? The yes, it's the Russian S. That's right. Um, okay, so the basics of MCL for a trivial example, if you're interested in the actual work, it's this guy's uh, PhD thesis. Actually a wonderful implementation, I would say. So what you do is, the, the basic assumption is that if you take a random walk around the network, right, then you're much more likely to stay within the community, within the cluster, um, then go outside of that cluster. There are no assumptions made other than that there is a substructure to the network, a cluster substructure to the network. Okay? So, basic idea is that you want to take longer length walks and estimate the probability of getting from one node to another. Random walks. Okay? All right. So, for a trivial example, let's say you had two nodes. There was a, a self loop and a, a connection between node A and B. And so you want to build an adjacency matrix of how things move around, okay? And then you want to normalize the columns to produce transition probabilities. So if you are in A and you need to get to all the other nodes in the network, you want the probability of you getting to the other nodes in this network to equal to one. So the sum of all the probabilities across the column has to equal to one. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So you produce this from the adjacency matrix, you normalize the columns to produce that. Okay? Again, there is no weight on the edges. You're not preferring one edge to another, and this is why it was important to, to design the cutoff for functional similarity. So the column will always have the same elements, right? The column will have the sum of the entries in the column will be equal to one. It's a probability. And the numbers will be the same. One half and one half, or one third, one third, and one third, right? Why? You said there is no weight. It doesn't prefer going to A or to B. So it's zero, 0,5 and zero, 0,5. Not if A and C are not connected. If there is no edge between A and C, for example. Yeah, okay, just between the connections. Yeah, but uh, so that's important, right? <laughs> so, okay. So the idea, and it's, it gets more important as we proceed. So the idea is, remember, we're taking these long walks, right? So we're taking these connections, right? So not one step, but two step walks or three step walks and so on and so forth. So you get, you square the matrix to get the probabilities after two steps, right? So better trust me on this one or Okay, you can compute if you want to. Um, and then the idea is that you get to this matrix. And this is what we call expansion, right? So we're trying to expand outside from where we are. And then uh, what you want to do is inflate the weight of each of these probabilities. So you want to separate the clusters as obviously as possible, right? So what you do is you square the matrix at every element and you renormalize. Okay? So expansion and inflation. 
So you expand by walking randomly and then you inflate the distances. How so, much, sorry? How do we renormalize? How exactly do we renormalize after squaring? Renormalize the column has to be one. It's still a probability. So you just normalize to one everything. Okay? All right. So you do this until convergence. And what you eventually get is a bunch of zeros and ones. And you can think about this, uh, or more or less zeros and ones, and you can think about this um, as if I'm in this row node, how credible are the columns as the starting points? As the, for each one of them, how credible are the starting points, right? So basically, how likely, if I'm right here, on the basis of these ones and zeros that they see, how likely are these particular columns of being in the same cluster? Okay? Is that clear? All right. So what that basically gets you is this. You go from this network to that, to that, to that. Fair? Okay. So what we did is we had 4.2 million proteins, we did the HSP cutoff of 10, we had 1.2 million functions after clustering. So what we wanted to see is how consistent a function, how functionally consistent are these clusters. And you can represent the functions, let's say, by the color over here. And what we found is, is this interesting thing. Um, we had these uh, functional groups of more than one sequence, so there were a lot of unique proteins, right? So we chose a really high conservative HSSP cutoff, so there were a lot of unique proteins. There were 900,000 unique proteins, so one protein per cluster. Okay, they were not connected to anything. This is not related to the clustering. This is just the 900,000 that don't connect to anything, okay? All right, and if you look at the annotations of these 900,000, you see that roughly, um, well, it's a little less than a third are known, a little less than a third are hypothetical, and a little over a third are unknown, okay? So we can debate about whether 10 HSSP is a good cutoff or not for accuracy reasons, but this, this is how it is right now, okay? So the really cool part was this, this part, where we can actually evaluate our functional groupings. And particularly this, so 3.3 million proteins fell into um, 335,000 clusters. Okay, some clusters were larger, some clusters were smaller, but we can focus on these 190,000 uh, clusters and, and look at their content because their annotations are available of these proteins. We have actually functional annotations for these proteins. And interestingly, if you split it into if you split it by rank, like how many of the proteins in a particular cluster share the same annotation, right? You see that if we took this highest rank, so 90 to 100 percent of the proteins in the cluster share the same annotation, and you see that 72 percent of the clusters that we formed were actually consistent, fully consistent. Okay. Now, <laughs> what's the matter? <laughs> now, the the catch is. So many of these would be annotated because they are they're using exactly that method. Yes, well, they don't use exactly this method. They, no. Yes, very close. So you are, you're correct. Obviously, if your annotations are from sequence similarity, then you would potentially just be biasing yourself. But there is no, absolutely no other way to check this. So, I mean, we can go back to just a small subset of 800 proteins, but that's not going to give us much because those proteins have arguably been studied to death at this point and they will probably have different annotations just because of the person who studied them. Okay, so let's assume for a second that this works. <laughs> All right, so then we can um, ask for any two organisms how functionally similar those two organisms are. Okay, so you have, how much time do we have? Uh, 10 minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, sorry guys, you're not gonna get the full story. So, or oh, I can try. Um, let's say that the organism A has uh, these five functions 
And organism B has these four functions. So you can ask what is the similarity of the two organisms. It's obviously not symmetric because of the function of size. So what we said is that we want organisms to be above about the same size in order to be similar functionally. Right? So if you have significantly more functions than your neighbor, then you probably are doing something different and you probably aren't functionally similar to begin with. So we actually use the lower value as the, yes? Uh, why argue about that in terms of similarity and not in terms of subsets and supersets, for example? One more time. Why would we then argue about function similarity and not say about function subsets and supersets? When you say function subset and superset, what do you mean? Mm, well, for example, we, we cannot say that organism B is similar to organism A in function if the amount of functions of organism B is significant, uh, significantly smaller. Mm -hmm. But we could argue that it is a functional subset. Yes, so we can argue that point. Uh, the problem is biologically that usually, for, so for bacteria, it's very expensive to maintain a, a, long, a large genome, right? So the reason why they usually maintain a large genome is because they use the genes that are in their genome. So if they have uh, 25 more functions, and they're doing those functions, then probably they're not functionally similar to the subset genome. Does that make sense? Okay. So the idea is that then we can design the similarity network once again. This is the organism network now. And we can ask, okay, at this threshold, let's say at 70% functional similarity, well, we get two clusters. At 35% uh, th threshold, if we use single linkage, we get one cluster, okay? Is that, is that clear? <coughs> that should be very clear. Okay, so if you use 10% functional similarity cutoff, this is what your 1,100 organisms look like, the 1,200 organisms. It's one huge cluster. All right, so if you ignore the color schemes for now, all you see is the connected nodes, okay? So what that generically means is that uh, organisms have some baseline core functions that everybody uses. I'm confused about what you say. I, 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 I find it difficult to ignore the colors. That's so statement number one. And since I do find it difficult to ignore the colors, I look at the colors. Okay, um, let me the explain colors, the colors. They're grouped. Yes, the colors group. So the color scheme is the outside scheme of taxonomy. So we colored the nodes according to the current taxonomic phylum class identification, right? We just wanted to show that in this, this visualization, right, which is a completely different algorithm from anything that we've used up until now, right? This, this is a force layout, force directed layout, right? So the idea is uh, that, you know, depending on the number of organisms, again, these edges are they don't have a weight, so it's just the number of organisms that's driving this layout, right? You can see groups of organisms. I forgot again. Now this this this, this grouping is a line means what? They are related by ten percent. At least ten percent similarity. Okay. So this is the idea that these guys, <laughs> these guys are ten percent, more than ten percent related. These guys are not, but they still fall into the same cluster because of the single linkage clustering. Okay? Yes? Single linkage between the yellow up there and... Well, single linkage being you link to whoever you are linked to. Yes? Uh, how did you decide the location of every node? Here? Right, so this is what I'm saying. This is the force-directed layout. So the idea is that the more nodes you have, the, the, the more they separate, the tighter so when, when, there, when there are, uh, there are uh, more connections, you try to uh, shorten the length of the connections? Uh, so the, the length of the connection is not meaningful. There is no... Uh, I'm saying why there are red dots uh, far away from the... Metrics. Right, so what I'm saying is that the length of the connection is not meaningful with regard to the functional similarity. There is no weight on the edge. So the weight on the edge, the length of the edge, is created by the layout algorithm, which carries no biological meaning, right? So it's the idea is to try to separate 
the things that are more connected, more densely connected, away from the things that are less densely connected. And the problem is, of course, that this is the bias of the organisms that are present. Remember, we study human-related organisms significantly more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, okay. So we can do this at uh, different cutoffs. 20, 30 cutoffs, depending on where you like it. It's still groups. Uh, the one thing that you see is that certain classes that uh, work together start splitting. Right, which is expected because if you go, let's say, lower from phylum, you go to class, to order, to all of this stuff, you know, you, you get finer definition. And so then we asked, okay, what does our classification look like as compared to uh, 16S RNA? So basically this is just using sequence similarity, by the way, in case you guys are wondering. Um, this is the functionome story. And this is 16S RNA. So we do better, but not much better. So you're green? We are green, yes. Okay. So we do better than 16S RNA, but not much better. And this is where the, the, the problem lies. The first time, yeah? 16S RNA, just sequence. Just the 16S RNA sequence, yeah. Yes. So the you know, all of this effort for, for basically nothing. But again, you know, we have this uh, semi-arbitrary assignment to species. So maybe we're not supposed to be getting a very good signal. We don't know, but we want to sort of understand what's going on. And if you make this point that the assignment to species is somewhat arbitrary, currently as it stands, then you can say, okay, well, why do we even bother was trying to assign species, okay? Why is this meaningful? Well, if we go back to the beginning of the lecture, the whole idea of species, assignment to species, is the idea of finding functional similarity, yeah? Maybe we could go from a sort of discrete uh, definition of species to a continual space? That would be amazing, right? And that's what we're sort of trying to get to. So the idea is this. Let's not do cutoffs. Cutoffs are bad. Okay, this they're arbitrary. They they create things which shouldn't be there. This fish is the um, network, fully connected network. Okay, where now there is weights on the edges. Okay, the layout. Be very careful. The layout has no meaning for now. Okay, it's just it looks cool at this point. <clears throat> We do the color schemes, right? It's fine, it's fine. It picks up the same annotations, more or less, I mean, as much as you can look at it. But why do we do that? <laughs> and this, this thing just never let go of me. Why do we do the species annotations? And if we step away from that and if you try to say, okay, we want to do not species annotations, but we want to do things that are useful in industry. I want to determine which antibiotics work for these bacteria. I want to know which bacteria I can use to do bioremediation, to clean up the oil spill. I want to know this thing. I don't care the, about the evolution of this bacteria. I want to use this bacteria, okay? In that case, it doesn't matter. Yes, lot, there's going to be lots of overlap in evolution because of the, you know, the normal vertical inheritance of DNA. But there's also going to be this bushiness of life of the exchange of DNA. So all I care about is these functional similarity. And the taxonomists forgive me, okay? So what, what I want to do is cluster this, not according to the colors, but according to the actually inherent uh, values inside. So it would be nice to do this non-hierarchical story. I don't know if we have an algorithm for that yet. What we used um, here specifically was uh, Louvain weight clustering, which basically tries to optimize modularity, right, over the network. Um, do you guys know what Louvain is? I don't think I have time to go through it. 
um, if you're interested, come talk to me. But the idea of Louvain is that you can use the weights on the edges in order to determine how close particular um, values should be, particular nodes in the, ver in the network should be. And you can, uh, so this is a particular modularity queue that's computed over the weight of the edges as compared to all the other edges and uh, versus uh, the, the nodes in a particular community. And you can compute, I don't usually put formulas on slides, but you can compute um, differences in modularity using that formula. And basically, in reality, what that means is if you had a network, you should uh, assign each node its own community and then try to move nodes in and out of community in order to optimize this Q value that, that you were looking at. And in the end, you end up clustering nodes into a community and you know, separating them out. So it's still hierarchical, that's my point, right? So whatever you get at the lower level, you also get at a higher level. I would like to step away from that, but for now, this is the way that we're doing it. And um, what you end up doing is basically going from this network to the color scheme to putting them into classes and then eventually into those. We looked at, and I'm going really fast now, sorry, uh, we looked at um, the different resolutions as compared to the assignments of the phylum class order, so the, the current taxonomic identifications. Uh, we said, okay, these taxonomists do know something, so let's pick the resolutions for every assignment which agree the best with a particular with a particular um, taxa, right? So we choose chose the peaks here as much as possible. Actually, I was very happy when I saw this because order this middle level was the only one that I actually believed in microbiology taxonomic assignments. So um, we were able to get 56 modules at 97 orders, so there's a smaller diversity that we believe is there, functional diversity that we believe is there. Now, if you actually looked at these contents of these modules, you see that some of them are in fact taxonomically unique, but some of them are very much distributed across taxonomies. So function actually has more or a different view on life than taxonomy does, okay? So if I went back to this slide, this is the current taxonomy this is what the natural clustering of that would look like, okay? And um, why is that important? So if I took, I am sure this is not very interesting to you guys, but uh, for biologists, this is amazing. If I took this little cyanobacteria over there, cyanobacteria are really interesting because they're the next source of energy for us, right? They're the energy producers. Um, and you looked at those cyanobacteria, According to their taxonomic identification, you would see that these organisms belong to the same uh, genus. But if you look at them functionally, they separate out. So here is a slightly different representation. There is functions in the middle as opposed to just edges connecting organisms. So they separate out and you see very clearly that the marine cyanobacteria are very different from the others, from the freshwater and symbiont cyanobacteria. And if you look at the genomes, it's like comparing twins, more or less, or very related siblings. If you look at these, um, Genomes, you could actually find the genes which are, we believe are responsible for this salt tolerance, which I think is really cool. Um, and then the other thing that you could also look at is mycoplasma. So these are all the mycoplasma that we have in our database, and these three, which separate out so nicely, actually happen to be living in the blood, right? So they're host um, symbionts. Okay. Um, yeah. So in summary, fusion is this thing that we call the function, oh, I can't even remember what, functional similarity organism network. Um, it's been through so many changes that it doesn't matter. Classification is, is great at classification of unannotated genomes because we don't actually have to have annotations for proteins in order to classify these organisms. And it's wonderful for new species discovery Right? So we, we, we can say that this is a new species or a new class or whatever module you want. Um, so this is on the, on the actual taxonomic level, but you could also do it on a module, on a functional module level. 
Network-based clustering of organisms is more robust than using thresholds of pairwise similarity. So I don't like thresholds, as I said, and what we see here is that we can not use those. And then functional comparison is informative of taxonomy, right? But it also allows for different classification means. And function-based classification seamlessly incorporates the effects of the environment and horizontal gene transfer, which evolution cannot deal with, with evolutionary targets cannot deal with. So, we're doing a lot of really cool stuff. If anybody wants to do any type of research with me, we can do this. And uh, I can stop here. The rest of it is just stuff. Okay.